I drove in this morning, oddly enough, and I heard the Grateful Dead. By the way, I'm going to start right off the bat. This is the On The Tape podcast. I'm Guy Adami, always joined by Danny Moses and Dan Nathan. But today, Dan, we're joined by Stuart Sopp, the co-founder of Current, and we're thrilled to have him. What better time to have him than now with all the things that are going on? Yeah, no doubt. I mean, you are our landlord, so you are the CEO <laughs> of Current here. Um, now, but we're really interested in getting your take. We often do this, um, you know, when, when it's inflation. We had Fed minutes this week. We had um, obviously a lot of data with that jobs data last week. We also had some consumer data from some higher end consumer, you know, retail brands, that sort of thing. So, like, that is going to be front and center for a lot of what we talk about. We got a ton of single stock stuff. Yeah, Dan, we do. Danny's got some procedural stuff on, on the short. Short rules changing, Danny. This feels like, you know what, de- deck, September deck 2008 a little bit for you? It's not. It's it's a short reporting rule, oh, not sorry. so much the tick rule, but I'll get into it when we, you know. We have a lot to get that. into, and it's interesting. I mentioned the Grateful Dead. Not that I'm a fan, and on my 845 song Spotify playlist, I don't have any Grateful Dead songs. But oddly enough, I heard, and it made me think, you know, it's interesting. I'm sure Jerry Garcia and his crew wore Birkenstocks back in the day. That was a big IPO this week, not a particularly good one. I'm sure Danny has some thoughts on that. But the song that I heard, Dan, was Ripple. And here's a lyric. Ripple in still water where there is no pebble tossed nor wind to blow. And I'm thinking to myself, holy cow, Jerry Garcia way back when in 1970 on the American Beauty album, he knew, he understood markets because the ripple effect of what we're seeing in a myriad of different things, is playing itself out, Danny Moses, right before our very eyes. And I'll start with the thing that we always like to talk about, the United States bond market, which has a tremendous range over the last couple of weeks. Let me just say, I know we'll get into this stuff later, but you know this stuff pales in comparison. Uh, it's great to be able to talk about the markets with what's going on in the world, but I just wanted to get that out of the way and come back to it later. Um, but let me just say, so... The auction market, right? If people watch, and we know that the treasury has to issue billions, tens, hundreds of billions, obviously of paper to fund this deficit that's been going on. And I've been a big believer that the long end of the curve is really moving more these days on supply demand with QT and auctions and foreign central bank selling than it is about inflation expectations. And we're seeing a what's called a, a tail today. We have one yesterday on the 10-year bond and a 30-year. What that means is basically the win issued price or where the kind of the 30 year was trading versus where the demand ended up being was basically, you know, 4.84% versus 480. And guy, we've talked about the volatility in, in the treasury markets for a long time since we started this podcast to have a 21 basis point range today on the 30 year, a 20 basis point range on the 10 year. People stop trying to use the bond market as a signal to buy equities or to sell equities, accept it for what it is. There's more sellers and buyers and don't try to overthink it. So that to me is a, a you know thing front and center. We could talk about the Fed minutes. We could talk about CPI, but I'll tell you this: the great Peter book I wrote, "There's no inflation if you don't have to eat, drive, or sleep anywhere." It was only up 0.1 percent. Just leave it at that. But anyway, the ripple effects going back to the song are tangible. I mean, we're seeing it in these bond moves, Stu. And you've been in this game a long time, and I'm not asking to trade the bond market, but to Danny's point, when you see moves of this magnitude over the course of minutes, literally minutes off this pretty miserable bond auction, you take notice because again, this should be the most liquid security on the planet, but it doesn't necessarily trade that way. Yeah, this is uh, the combination of all, all this year coming coming kind of to a head, right? All the issuance uh, that is uh, now deemed to come out. Um, I think when you see uh, the long end, ten, at least tens at four, seven, four, eight, the short end at five and a quarter, they're on hold, obviously. Well, maybe on hold. We can talk about the Fed. And the view there, it's very hard for the Fed to do any kind of yield curve control, right? They can't buy bonds if they're if they're below the short end. And so the 30 and the 10 year, I think, still have there's still no clearing price. That's what Danny's saying, right? The clearing price still isn't kind of there. We haven't found where people want to buy these things. These things being American treasuries, right. uh, the uh, <laughs> the most liquid bond market in the world. Um, so I think you look. I don't bet me. Uh, you know, don't don't. You know, I wouldn't put money on this, but another percent, you know, 150 bips you could see in the tens, I think, before it really starts to. Yeah, I know. So, like, that's you're, why I'm saying like don't quote Jamie Diamond camp a little well, bit. Well, I think he's doing that. This is my personal opinion. He's probably doing that to really torpedo mm-hmm. Bank of America, 100%. right? So he's trying to get his competition a little, a little shiv uh, sort of situation because 
the hold to maturity bucket is gigantic, right? And obviously, uh, with Whoa. the tangible. Yeah. Shiv, wait, just just you know, and guy's not going to get this. You're going to get this. Was that a double entendre? Because Shiv and Succession Correct. ultimately no, that, is, was, that was that meant was to be? Yeah, like, so oh, all the names wrote? were planned out for oh, for that. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's yeah. So all the names had a little bit. bit. You didn't know that. Yeah. All the names had to double the meaning, and apparently, uh, some clever group of people on Twitter, which uh, you're not on, well, there you so you go. don't know. I missed uh, it. On X.com, they worked out who was going to win from the names. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Was big spoiler though. Yeah, yeah. So I think specifically Jamie Dimon. I look. I don't know any insight. This is just my opinion. I suspect he's looking at Bank of America's hold to maturity bucket, which they don't have to revalue market prices yet. Um, he's like, hey, you know, he's probably trying to talk that the, the the bonds a little bit lower for them. And intangible book, you know, looks through all this stuff. So he's, you know, he's probably playing a few games. But I'm just looking at what the Fed could do right now, and they can't do a lot in the long end. And I don't think they want to. And when you look at the the uh, inflation that we got, it's all higher for the third month in a row. And I'd love to talk a little bit more about it, but I think we're going to see a reacceleration here. And I think it's in food, food so inflation. I want to talk about inflation. Danny has thoughts as well. But going back to Jamie Dimon, you're right. I do think it's sort of a salvo, a missile across the bow of Bank of America without question. But it doesn't mean he doesn't believe it either. Yeah, I think true. it works for, I think it. I think he believes it. And I also think it works to his advantage to a certain point. Yeah, I think you're right. I think things t typically over overswing as they normally do. Bonds are really hard to overswing, but you know, 150 bips from here would really, you know, you'd start to see some real, real fireworks. Right? Well, you know, it's funny if we're going to stay on this Grateful Dead theme. I'm going to go to uh, from the Mars Hotel, Ship of Fools. It was later than I thought when I first believed you. Now I can't share your laughter, Ship of Fools. Wow. I think there was a little bit of that going on a little bit because Brian Moynihan over here, you know, in that Bloomberg article that talked about Moynihan's wrong way bets on treasuries, and, and they actually went in, and this was well planted. We were talking about the shivs that were out for David Solomon from Goldman earlier in the year. Remember that kind of string of articles and the such? And it really, that can only happen from inside, right? There has to be folks who want to take, you know, like they want to go at, the, you know, the king, if you will. And at Bank America, they finally did it. And the reporters did a great job because they went in in that Bloomberg article and they actually quoted Jamie Dimon from October 2020 saying that we are not going to be investing in securities that are offering us 50, 60, 70 bips or so. So um, it's certainly... Certainly later than Brian Moynihan thought that he'd have to consider the fact that, you know, those now 10-year treasuries where they were investing in are now at 4.5% plus, I think 47 as we're speaking right now. Yeah, Marianne Lake, and uh, Jane, like she worked for Jamie as the CFO. I think she was a big proponent of not doing that. And I think a lot of their success, recent success, probably down to her and her decisions over, over that period. It's interesting, Danny. You know, we play the game on this show on Fast Money. If I had told you that PPI this week would have come out as hot as it did, CPI on Thursday equally as hot, where would the S and P be? And I would have been easy down a hundred handles, if not more. And quite frankly, the market hangs in here pretty well. What do you think? The I mean, in your opinion, you've done this a long time. What is the market looking at right now? Because it's clearly not taking into consideration to. Stu's point, this reacceleration of inflation. Well, I think that within the Fed minutes, people are very, you know, short-term oriented. They acknowledge, for instance, the, you know, the um, UAW strikes that are going on. They, they acknowledged higher rates on the long end within the Fed minutes. And I think we saw Fed fund futures trade down to basically a 10% chance now of a hike. I will tell you, though, it's still higher for longer when I look, when I look on the sheet. I want to go back to the comment that Stu made about Diamond. I got a, a nice friend in Washington DC connected friend who will be a guest on our, our show soon enough, who was hearing that Basel three implementations are going to get pushed out and delayed for the big US banks, which makes a lot of sense. And I think part of what he was doing was begging a little bit to say, not do this. And I'll tell you what I've been saying now for about six months that the SLR requirements, I think will be relaxed at some point for the big banks. If you guys are right, Stewart's point that US Treasury, the long end is going to go up 100 to 150 basis points. It's not a sustainable economy there. That, that we know. So I would be looking, if you want me to be bullish and, and think that you get some type of relief in the market, it will come in the form of something non-fundamental, which would be a move out of Washington. So yes, the, I don't, listen, I'm in the camp, obviously we still have inflation, um, but it's coming down. You're going to have months where on a comp basis it goes up, but I'm a believer. And the reason I'm a believer in that is I believe the economy is slowing and it'll, it'll self-fulfill. However, the services component, the things that you have to have, car insurance, right? The, the point, your point, like that's, that's going up. Like that's not coming back. Health insurance, which had a, a weird reading, it had it down. We know it's going to spike next month because of all the re-ups. So 
it's, we're going to continue this basis. All I can tell people is look within those sectors, within the service sector, go find the companies that have pricing power that are doing well and go invest in them. Because if the consumer is going to stay resilient and strong, then you're getting a real live look into pricing power that some of these companies may have. Yeah. And I guess consumers, you know, we had um, your, your old boss, Steve Eisman on Fast Money early in the week. Danny, I don't know if you caught the interview. And, and he, he, he mentioned something sort, sort of similar in a way. You know, he said consumer oriented companies that don't rely on financing of the, the, the purchase of those products, they're going to do obviously a whole heck of a lot better. And I think that's what you've been saying. And you've been saying this actually for a long time. So like to your credit, you know, about the stock market guy, it's kind of interesting as we're recording this on Thursday afternoon, the S&P is trading 43.42. Exactly two years ago mm-hmm. on, 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 on October 12th, 2020, 21, the S&P was close, trading at 43.42. Now, interestingly, we all know where, where, where rates are. We know where inflation is. We know where oil is higher. We know the dollar is higher. We know all those sorts of inputs that we think about valuations for equities. They actually, they, they really should be like weighing on equity valuations. And our friends over there, you know, our main man, who, who do we call Butters. Butters, over there at FactSet, you know, the 12-month P.E. ratio for the S&P 500 is that this is the forward at 17.7 is below the five year average of 18.7. OK, so it's just a little below that, but it's above the 10 year average of 17 and a half. Just think about where rates have been on average over the last 10 years where we had, you know, the, 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 the forward P.E. at those levels. So stocks really don't make a whole heck of a lot of sense, given the fact that everything we know um, about inflation being um, persistent here and not likely to collapse. And if inflation inflation were to collapse the way that they have deflation over there in China, you better watch out below because that will not be something that will be great for equity valuations, in my opinion. Stu, what do you make of, I mean, we understand what's going on in the Middle East. It's heartbreaking. Danny can talk about it. But through the lens that we look at, you know, the geopolitical risk and potentially um, escalations, what is that, when you look at the landscape, the, the economic landscape, what does it suggest is about to happen or is happening. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, obviously a a horrendous, tragic terrorist attack that happened over there. Um, Also, by the way, I would uh, would add, affects people at current. We're an, you know, we we were a company based here in New York and serving American, uh, everyday Americans uh, for the financial needs, but people who work at New York uh, largely from all around the world. So we're also personally affected. People are, are over there getting caught up for reservists and all this other stuff. So deeply tragic and and personally affecting for people here. Um, from a geopolitical uh, sense, it looks, man, there's so many things that really confuse me, like the the Israeli defense not being there, to, uh, to Egypt giving a warning three days before that, you know, there's all these things. And like, I think when you look at the outcome, uh, it looks like a Syria-Iran situation, clearly Saud, it's all around nuclear power and all this other stuff. So when I think geopolitics, I'm like, okay, you're sending two aircraft carriers over, you're not doing that for no- for nothing. We're showing a strong response, which I think is correct, right? I think that's the correct. I think Biden and, the, and this administration is doing that right. I think doing things in public with the Saudis and, and, and Iranians is probably not right. It, culturally, that's just misaligned. So I think there's probably more tension coming when you're sort of saying things in public to them. Um, and I think from an oil perspective, um, yes, the economy is slowing. But look at gas. Look at look at look at the crack spend and what's happened. Look at nat gas. You saw what happened over this, and so and you look at the the. I've, I know I came on a few times and said buy nat gas in the twos. Well, we're in the threes now, and it's probably going to ten. That's where I think it's going over the next two. Not not now, two years, one year, right? And I think there's structural. Like we're now selling nat gas uh, uh, from America to Europe. Like that's what we're doing, and so and 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 that'll come online over the next few months. And I think there's just you know. Let's see what winter looks like in Europe and all this other stuff. And so from a macroeconomic, I think it affects commodities more broadly, destabilization. I think Israel, Palestine having a fight, or Hamas, I should distinguish those two, uh, it's important. I don't think has changed too much when it comes to volatility yet. But when it's Syria or Lebanon or Iran are involved, which I think is almost inevitable, we're going to start seeing VIX rip. So it's interesting. All of this is fascinating. Do you think rates are going higher. I do as well. The knee-jerk reaction from what we saw over the weekend is typically, historically, some flight to quality in the form of the U.S. dollar, which we're seeing around the edges, but more specifically, the U.S. bond market, which makes yields go lower. We saw that for about two and a half days. 
And here we are, yields going back up, which suggests to me, I think it reinforces your belief, but it suggests to me that, you know what, this bond market, regardless of all the things that we're talking about, has an absolute bid to it in terms of yields or an offer to it in terms of the flip side of the coin, the bond market. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, I we just chatted to Danny before about gold. You sold a hundred hundred. I want to talk about that. So I think that's you know that's the real collateral. I, I remember several times over this year I've said gold is and bricks have now made it official. Gold is now this uh, is old money is now new money. That is real money now again for at least a large part of the world, and the U.S. bonds are not right. And so that is what they're basing a lot of their international settlement trade on. And so when you see uh, disturbances in the Middle East. And China and Russia probably just accumulating more gold. Look at the Shanghai uh, spread, right? Ripped into this. Well, right? Danny, I mean, we've talked about this. And I know, listen, we are aligned in terms of gold. And we've brought up that last year, central bankers bought north of $70 billion worth of gold with a B. That's 1,221 tons, a record amount. They're on pace to do similar this year. And there was an article, there was a, I think one of the strategists out there this week put out a note effectively saying, I'm paraphrasing, you know, this buying of gold by central banks is effectively, they're hedging their own ineptitude. That's something that we've been saying for quite some time. But I think the gold market just flinched this week, Danny, and we've been fooled before. But to me, it feels as if we're in the early innings of what's going to be a very interesting next few months in the gold market. Yeah. I mean, this is a show about the markets. We always talk about geopolitics and how it impacts the markets, including gold and we talk about those things and never has something hit home so close to my heart than what's happening in israel and being the grandson of holocaust survivors and being through that i'm not going to delve in and it's hard it's it seems easier when you talk about china taiwan and and other things that are going on and when it impacts people directly so from a sensitivity perspective i just want to get that out of the way and so making money is secondary however people that are professional money managers can't stop what they're doing the markets closed after 9-11. We had to reopen. We had to deal with, with, you know, how to underwrite what's happening in the world. And gold, I will tell you, obviously didn't want this event to obviously happen or any event to happen. But you bring up the point, Guy, that, you know, we've had a $70 or $80 move in gold here, kind of off the lows here in recent days. And it was working, obviously, in tandem with treasury yields being lower and geopolitical um, thermometer rising. However, the move back today with a stronger dollar and rates moving higher, gold's not really giving back. And that tells me right now, I know it's maybe off seven or $10 or some highs, that tells me that it now has, is gonna start to, people are gonna pay a premium for it potentially to hedge out some of the stuff. You talk about the bond market, we just talked about the treasury auctions. Well, if you're gonna start, you know, obviously hoping, helping Israel and continue to fund things in the Ukraine and in Ukraine and all that. So we have our own problems here as far as our US deficit. If we're going to be the champion of the world freedom, which I hope we continue to be, it, that's going to come at a cost. And I think that, again, back to the supply and demand and the need to keep funding the government. Hey, listen, guys, I, I hate to disagree with all you. I, I think gold acts horribly. I, I really do. And, and the fact that, you know, crude oil filled in the gap from Monday and, 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 and you know, is kind of flirting with the lows that it was trading at before this, you know, unforeseen terrorist attack. I'm just, wait, hold on, Danny. I'm just, just going to say, so gold had this move and, you know, rallied, you know, from 1810 to, you know, 1870. It's reversed today. Like, why, why, isn't, why isn't it higher today? If there's so much demand for this, why is Bitcoin down, you know, three, four percent over the last couple trading days? I don't know. I mean, like the one thing that I routinely learn about like market events like this that we really can't like kind of model out or whatever. And, and again, I am with you. I think we are all in the same camp. Making money and navigating financial markets um, is secondary. I know when we started, we we turned the mics on to do our Monday pod at what nine a.m. Um, guy, and we were like, we don't really want to do that. I mean, we spent the weekend like all of you guys, you know, like. Like, like everybody, just an absolute shock of the horror that was inflicted on on just hundreds of civilians there. And 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 we all are, you know, uh, sadly enough, um, we know it's going to get worse before it gets better. To your point, Stuart, I mean, there's going to be some sort of, you know, some other sort of response. So we're like in it now, right? And and the situation in Ukraine seems to be not getting a whole heck of a lot better and, and pretty, pretty bad over there for, for many civilians too. But I'll just say this, like, why isn't gold? Why isn't isn't gold screaming between 1900, you know what I mean? And, yeah. and 2000. Can I, can I, I have to interrupt you because yeah. if you think about, if you just use the dollar or you just use the 10 year, and I told you that the dollar will be back where it was five days ago, that the yields will be back where they were five days ago, but gold, I'm looking at the year end futures in gold. So the December futures were 1820. 
they got up to almost two, uh, 1900, they're hanging around 1880. My point is it has made this 55, $60 move. It has not given in completely. I believe on a relative basis, it's not performing. What I'm saying is I think that Stuart's point and Guy's point about geopolitics and your point about geopolitics, I think that now something like this that has occurred has really brought it front and center. And it's, and it's how, you know, there, there's offshoots of it happening all over the world. And I think that's what's going on to Stuart's point. What other countries may get involved here, what may happen. And it's in a very important area of the world as far as commerce and, and, and energy prices. And so, I don't know. I just feel like this is the geopolitical thing that hasn't been priced in before that's getting a little bit of a... Think, I think price. it's hanging in there. I agree with you. And I understand what Dan is saying as well. But let's just talk about this, Stuart. You've been in this world, so you understand. You know, we look at everything through the lens of an equity market, which is significant in its size. And if people want to allocate a few billion dollars into a stock or an ETF or an indice, it's not going to necessarily move the needle. That's how deep those markets are. Conversely, if the same type of allocation tries to make its way at the same time into the gold market specifically, but silver as well, then the needle starts to move. Now you say, well, why hasn't that happened yet? It hasn't happened yet because gold's really on the back burner for so many of these institutions. It gets on the front burner when their systems kick in. Their systems will kick in through the prior all-time high that we saw earlier this year and that same high a couple of years ago. So my point is, I get what Dan is saying, but there will be a day where it's, I believe you're going to have one of these $50 moves, another $50 move. These systems will be triggered. Then all this allocation that tries to make its way in the gold market, the market isn't deep enough to basically take it in, absorb it, and not move. That's what I think we're sort of setting up for here, Stu. Yeah. Um, just to go back to my old FX days, you cross it up, uh, gold, you know, gold dollar versus um, gold yen. Look at gold yen, and it hasn't given back much, and it's close to its all-time high, or at least double top of recent highs. And so I think you have to carve out specifically what's going on with the bond market in America and what the D DXY is doing. There are some really fundamental tectonic shifts happening in the US, and so maybe gold dollar is maybe not the right way to look at it, but look at it across every other country or every other, other currency, and it's doing okay. Right. And I'm just saying this, though, but like most reasonable folks who recommend gold for like most investors suggest that you should have low single digits percentage in your portfolio. So like have at it, people. Like you're going to have your day guy. And I don't mean to sound glib about well, it. Well, you do. But what but I'm saying is like it really, it's not, it's not going to do a whole heck of a lot unless you're like Peter Schiff. You know what I mean? And you're all in. I mean, like so, so I, we, I'm just saying we, we spend we, a lot. We can move on. But this is not a 3 a.m. ad. This is not a one in No, I know. But ad. Danny, my only point is, point. We, thank you for saying we can move on. I think we're spending a lot of time okay, on something we'll that most on, people don't own. That we'll most people don't today, own, yeah. and and they, the way, if they do, they own a few a few percent tops. Yeah, that's yeah, that's it. Fair enough. Yeah, except that you know we're talking it through the lens of what's going on in the world and what central banks have been doing. Why are the central? So you can you know we can be glib about most people don't own gold. I totally get it. Well, they're most not people buying listen. treasuries anymore. So, so like for instance, they got to buy something. Who's you know? they? Well, the the central banks, right? So you got you have also been saying that. Right. The, so know, why are so the question then has the begs to ask, you know why is central banks buy a record amount of gold last? What are they seeing and why are they doing it again this year? Now the pushback is well, it didn't move the price. That's correct. The reality though is there's no incremental seller here. You know when when the buyers do come in, the central banks are not going to be the seller of last resort. That's when things get really interesting. And I think the allocation is still going on right before our very eyes, Stu. You know what else happened, Guy? You know what else happened? In, in China, for the first time since 2015, they bought banks. They bought publicly traded banks. They spent 65 million U.S. dollars last night just to, you know, build up that confidence in the system. So as ICBC, China Construction, you know, the other big ones, the Bank of China that they, that they bought. Again, another token move, called a central bank, called a own portfolio manager, whatever you want to call it. But here we have, you know, people trying to do things in various ways to prop up or, you know, give an image that things are put okay. By the way, as we see here, the yen is marching right back towards that, that one phase. There you go, yeah. Which is fascinating. So let's shift gears here because I understand that, you know, maybe we've, people have tuned out on the gold conversation. <laughs> but Stu, your world yeah. is, you, you know who your customer is. And we have seen firsthand the weakness in names like Target and Five Below and Dollar Gen and Dollar Tree. We've talked about it now for weeks. That's one side of the barbell. The flip side of that is what we heard anecdotally, I get it, from an LVMH earlier this week. So now you're seeing it 
on one side of the equation, and now you're seeing it on the flip side as well. So what do those sort of data points suggest about the U.S. consumer specifically, but just about economics and broadly? Yeah, I think um, with inflation looking forward, I'm most worried about food inflation. So, and I don't think it's priced in yet. If you look at, you know, Danny was just quickly mentioning like, you know, car car insurance and healthcare insurance. None of this stuff is like, like fully priced into the BLS numbers. And so when you're talking about um, an everyday American, blue collar working hard, maybe on strike, right? We're seeing some of that right now from UAW and all that stuff. They are over indexing on staples, right? On staple goods. So it's like food, rent, fuel, like it's the main things that they try and remove and say there's no inflation. And so you look at like the futures market, o- orange juice, for example, I don't know how much you drink, but like orange juice is up 300%. It's up 100% in the last few months. Um, olive oil up 100% this year. Live cattle up 20%. They're all up 300% plus since 2020, but they're up a lot more over the last few months. And so every input cost to CPG and fast food and these fast casual restaurants that you're mentioning, um, like McDonald's, Chipotle, and all these other guys, they're, they're very small margin businesses, high volume, and it's the demographic that we're serving. And they probably work there as well, by the way. That's generally what happens. And so what you're seeing is, is that their earnings are going to get smashed and they have to raise prices and it's taking money out of everyday Americans. Their money is going f- far less. Stuart, I have a very important question. Stuart, a very important question. Is the stuff that you put in your hair to make it look so good, and is that price going up? Because you may go bankrupt. I mean, you have the best, the best kind of thing I see, though. I'm just curious. Have you noticed an increase in that price? It's, it's argan oil, and I, and I borrow it's from my it. Wife, it's from my wife's side of the uh, bathroom counter. It's heated oh, argan perfect. oil. So here's, so this is Danny's world as well. So two, I think it was two years ago, Goldman Sachs purchased Green Sky which is a digital lender. And everybody talked about much Ballyhoo deal. Well, they basically round trip this thing. And, and I'm not necessarily saying they're a competitor of yours, but you clearly watch that space too. So when you see that, is that a good thing or a bad thing or does it not move the needle at all? It doesn't move the needle. I think, I think it's indicative of players that came into fintech and saw the consumer um, sort of gold rush of that last 10 years, which I think was a zero interest rate policy sort of led or driven or tailwinded event. And they're just exiting, right? So we see Marcus basically largely fail uh, as a consumer uh, play. I mean, it probably it probably did very well in the fact that they could get like low cost funding for their trading business and their lending and all that other stuff. But from a consumer mindset, I don't think Marcus, they threw a lot of money at it. And then from Green Sky point of view, I think that's been round tripped a couple of times. Yeah. I think the biggest winner is probably the founder there. I got a green sky story for you here. Yeah, guys. So <laughs> let me just be very clear what they do. They don't compete with Stu. No. Now the other parts of the business might, but green sky. So let's say a plumber comes to your house, right? And you want to, you got to put on a plumbing. It's going to cost you $6,000. You say, I don't have $6,000. Well, lucky you. I happen to have something right here. I have an, a credit app, by the way, no income verification. Where have we heard that before? Where you can get a $6,000 loan from green sky. Just sign here. All good. You're going to be charged whatever percentage and you'll make monthly installment payments. Okay, great. So. This is crazy because COVID hits, right? This company's, and people were already on this company. The CFPB was saying you're charging people too much, too high of a rate. What happened? Obviously, rates went back down. Fed cut rates during COVID, all the CMS. What else accelerated? Home building, home improvement came in. So Goldman, in all their wisdom, decided to purchase. They made the announcement in the fall of 21 to buy Green Sky, okay? For $1.7 billion. At the time, it was 2.2. Fast forward, well, then it closed the deal in March 2022 or something like that. The rumors are that they've sold this now for $500 million. So we don't know what the credit losses were between here and there. So they sold this to Sixth Street Partners and to PIMCO. PIMCO, I think, took some of the loan book and whatever. But the point is this, is this is one of those companies that if COVID hadn't have happened and we'd gone on a normal course of cycle, Goldman never would have purchased it, in my opinion, because it never would have looked potentially as good on paper. So Goldman wrote it off today. We're going to get their earnings next week. You know, they, they took a write down, but the rumors are that they sold it for $500 million. So a little bit worse than a round trip. You know, I yeah. bring it up because Stu hit the nail on the head. This, this is all a function of easy money for so long. Zero interest rate policies allowed a lot of people to get in. And that, again, the knock-on effect, the tangential thing, the ripple effect, if I may go back, is exactly what we're seeing now. So if you don't think a move of 525 basis points over the course of the last 18, 20 months or so doesn't have ramifications, it does. And that's, again, anecdotal again, but you're going to see 
more and more of these types of announcements, I would think, Stu. Yeah, I th that's right. I think um, being really philosophical the other day, I was thinking uh, <laughs> the uh, rare, um, that the, there's only two business models, unbundling and rebundling, right? We all know that. And I think whatever unbundled or rebundled in the in the ZERP era of 10 years has to be unwound inversed for the next 10 years. And so I, I think that's a really healthy way of sort of looking at like these purchases of say Goldman, what they were doing, or even FinTech, which I'm, I'm really close to, what we did as, a, as an industry is we unbundled everything. We took down very, very narrow verticals. We'll do this and this, and the big banks won't have time to, to really react. And then when the cost of money has gone up for the next, you know, I think the next five or 10 years, um, it's about rebundling those packages again. Maybe the incumbents are slightly more advantaged, right, in, the, in, that, in, that, in that world. And so I, I think it's an interesting lens to, to look through various sectors and, and industries to see where the trend will be for the next few years. We talk about short selling a lot, Danny. I know this gets you exorcised from time to time. And you talk about the only two business models, bundling and unbundling. But in our world, there's a constant moving of goalposts. And it seems to sort of, for whatever reason, manifest itself in a lot of these short selling things. I mean, Danny, you can speak to this. We've had this conversation for some reason, market participants view short sellers as sort of, uh, you know, the 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 all in evil that was, you know, the, all evils put together. Yet they play a vital role in the marketplace. I would submit. Yet once again, here's the SEC change. I think changing short seller disclosure rules. Yeah. So listen, after GameStop and AMC and all the stuff went on, and and the Retail community was upset, I think, for valid reasons with Citadel, et cetera, and market structure in general. And, you know, how can there be more shares short than are outstanding and all those things and not securing borrows? I won't go into all that. The SEC had to start doing things at least to try to, you know, investigate it, figure it out and all that. So I don't think they found anything, obviously, during that process that was that bad. However, this is really interesting. So if you're a, a bank, like if you're a broker, per se, and you're Goldman Sachs and and they and we short a stock by borrowing that security from them. Normally it's twice a month that that type of disclosure has to go out. It's every 15 days or something to short interest in a stock. What the SEC is now going to require is every 15 minutes, whatever the total amount is, not by fund name, but by security, is being shorted, right? Is being borrowed, I should say. They're gonna they're gonna have it. It's gonna be published. Now you think about that for a second. I'm sure there'll be workarounds where, all right put my trade together, don't put it on the tape, commit, you know, commit capital, we'll figure it out later to try to protect. If you don't think that the algorithms are going to figure that out, that these quant funds are going to figure that out, a real time movement in a stock. So let me give you an example. Let's say that stock XYZ, you know, had earnings coming up on, on, on a Friday and it was a Tuesday. And all of a sudden you get the short reports, this huge short interest mounting. It would wake people up, whether that short trader would be right or wrong or whatever it might be. And maybe that trader would be unable to get their full position on. So it's just going to add another element of playing this game. And listen, there are some elements of it which will impact high-frequency traders, which I think is good on the short side, right? And so it, it, it gets more transparency. I get it. But again, it's another level of expense. And I think it does nothing in the long run. But it is what it is. The SEC had to do something. So they're going to vote on that on Friday. So keep your eye on that. And we'll talk about it, I'm sure. You know, Stu, this is interesting to me. And you look at these things from... Dan, Danny, and I watch tick by tick. I, I'm sure you're too busy to do this, but once again, some of these stocks are back on their horse. Nvidia very quietly is going from 415 as we're sitting here. It's north of 470 dollars. A lot of these semiconductor stocks are back on the horse. Apple very quietly from 172 north of 180. Again, is it a perceived flight to whatever? I'm not sure. Is it just a confidence in the market? But when you see this, you know, happen over and over again. Thoughts, if any, on not necessarily, I'm not asking about those stocks and what it means in terms of the market, though. Yeah, we're trying to work out where all the money's going. Right. right. And so it's not treasuries, but we know the dollar's going up, still 107. I still think it continues higher. Um, these uh, top seven or whatever you want to call it, top 10, I can't remember what they're called. There's, there's, don't say it. Don't, <laughs> well, I won't say it. Um, they're, they're basically banks, right? Apple has enough money that it's earning so much interest with, they can just park it at, you know, and treasuries and they're basically banks, right? And they also do lending now. And so I think what you're seeing there is flight to safety in things that can appreciate, which are not the US bond market. They're basically so big, trillions of dollars of market cap that big money, especially in America, can allocate. And I think that's what you're seeing. So um, the, uh, the, the multiples are crazy uh, in my view, personally. I think AI is overblown. We've talked about it separately, Dan. 
Um, it doesn't mean it won't work in the medium and long term. I just think at this price, it's probably not the right price. I'm far more cautious. I'm probably ringing a little bit of a bell from like to tomorrow and next week onwards. I think the core underneath everything, everything's been lifted by these seven. It's a flight to safety. At some point, you know, we're going to see geopolitical risks come through. And these are global companies. These are global companies that get knocked when there's a China problem or there's a Middle Eastern problem. Danny, they have become their own asset class just vis-a-vis -vis the market cap of these names. I mean, all, not all, but somewhere between $800 billion and $2.5 trillion. I mean, individually, they could be their own asset class. So is it just that simple that there's this flight to perceived safety in these names? Because I will tell you, it frustrates the shit out of me watching this daily. Well, yes, and they're very liquid securities, so you can be wrong and get out over a period of time. And I'm, I'm also surprised at their performance of how they have held up, especially relative to the market. And I think people were positioned the opposite, right? So here we go again, where, you know, if you're a multi-strat fund and you start to take down leverage on the fund, the things you were short, you need to cover the things you were long, you need to sell, right? It's indiscriminate. So if you were trying to short these names instead of shorting the S&P and you were long other names, your longs go down, what do you have to do? You got to cover them. So I think part of it is offsides in the market a little bit. So it's a lot of everything. And again, I think all seven of those companies are very different. And I, and I, don't, I don't think they should be grouped together at all. And I think over the next several months, the end of 23, after this quarter, and I think into 24, we're going to see a separation of a I, lot of Listen, I agree with you. I'm not suggesting they're the, the same, you know, the same only in their scope and their magnitude of the size of the companies. But you're right. I mean, some of those companies value for fa Facebook, for example, despite the run, you could still make a pretty cogent argument in terms of valuation. You could pretty much say the same thing about Google. The flip side of that coin, if we're introducing Microsoft and Apple to a certain extent, I think you're talking about valuations that are probably stretched. We lump them together for obvious reasons. And I, you know, so whether they deserve to be or not doesn't matter. That's what the market has effectively done, Danny. Yeah. And I would say the flip side of all of this we're seeing from the Magnificent Seven is the IPO market. The last four or five big IPOs are all trading below, right? So you talk about excitement in the market, bringing new companies, new blood into the market. This Birkenstock priced at $46. And by the way, congratulations to L. Catterton, great fund, who sold over 21 million shares on the deal at 46. Thank you, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, and Morgan Stanley for leading that and pricing it for them. And the company raised just almost 11 million shares on that. So roughly just under half a billion dollars in the fund. And I'm sure it's a good company. They got unlucky in the markets, maybe unlucky on LVMH, as we talked about a lot of sales in Europe. But the, the point is that I think, the, I think the window for the IPOs creaks open and now is literally going to be slammed shut here, as I think, and, and Dan can run down their performance of some of these other ones that are kind of out there. But so that's another element of the market. And if you can't own those, again, where do you go? Well, like it's interesting. Quote, you know, to, to your point, Instacart was one that we know, you know, came public at what, like a, a 50, at least 50% haircut to its last um, private market valuation a couple years ago. And when you just think, I think Stu just mentioned the hype around AI, you're not talking about the technology. You're not, you, you, you know what I mean? Because you, you, you guys, and we've talked about this on OK Computer, you and Trevor and, and, and your, your whole team, you guys have been investing in machine learning. Learning, you know, since the, since you started, right? And so this is all just, you know, this is how technology evolves. It gets different names, it gets hype cycles. But if you look in the private market, so we've talked about Nvidia, you know, which is up two hundred twenty four percent on the year, right? It's gained hundreds of billion dollars in market cap because they're the only game in town when it comes to these, you know, advanced graphics chips that are training these models, right, and putting put in supercomputers, and 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 they've seen their, you know, demand for them go up, uh, you know astronomically. But here's the thing. If all those customers, many of which are actually now competing with them to develop chips, much cheaper chips for themselves, right? Like to, to kind of um, put into their own systems, um, it's going to decelerate, right? So there aren't too many pure play ways to invest in this in the public markets. Microsoft's been a beneficiary. Uh, Alphabet has been a beneficiary of late. I think some of the excitement in and around Meta of late is also in, in some of the stuff that they're doing there with their large language models and their generative AI. But here's the thing, okay? In the private markets, it's going to be an absolute shit show. If you look at the way that OpenAI has just exploded in value, what, to $90 billion or something like that, when, you know, and then Anthropic, I mean, Amazon and Alphabet are tripping over each other over the last couple of months to invest in this company. It's gone from $2 billion to maybe $30 billion when we see the next print or something like that. How do these companies grow into those valuations? So the other thing I'll just say about the IPO market, and, and Birkenstock is a little different, okay? If you are interested at any point over the last five years, whether you're a public 
market investor or private market investor in, let's say, an Instacart, you did not have to wait until it went public to get involved in that, right? Because of all of these crossover funds and the like here. So there's a different dynamic, I think, in the IPO market now. A lot of folks which were that incremental buyer when you're going public on the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange and you get that great photo shot, you know what I mean, of you up there and ringing the bell and all that sort of stuff. It's different now. You had every opportunity in the world and a lot of folks were going in in a zero interest rate environment and buying in the illiquid private markets because they thought that was going to be the time for them to recognize the alpha. So I think the IPO market has changed pretty dramatically. And I would say last thing here is I would think that we're going to see a pickup in strategic M&A. And that's where a lot of these private companies are going to be able to realize better outcomes, better exits than IPOing on the NYSE or the NASDAQ. I 100% agree with that. Um, I think the IPO market probably is. It was ba- barely jarred open. <laughs> it's like, and it's like now closed. And also, I, I, I have to comment on the Birkenstock CEO. He had three buttons down. Mm. Ah, very Engelbert. Engelbert Humber, amazing. Yeah. Um, what a what a. Oh, you hit. loved it. Oh, I just think it. You know, he three he owned, buttons down. He owned it. Stu Sop here is going to be. It's going to be a hairy mess. It's a, it's ready, I'm ready for very <laughs> frank cool. here. Yeah, I ready thought it was this, amazing. Ready for this stat? Okay, it's the worst IPO performance of a company its size, right? It's an $8 billion company in the last two years. It's the 13th worst IPO of a company its size in the last hundred years. So, I mean, that's a staggering number when you think about it, but there aren't a lot of companies that size that go public, right? You get the Blackstones, you get all those things that occur that are big, but this, that's, that's really something to think about. So you're saying, Danny, I should button up. Yeah, right. But here, here's here, here's <laughs> that's your plan. Here's one that's other thing, plan. and I think Stu, you'll agree with me right now, is that we might not see Anthropic or OpenAI or you know Stripe. You know, Stripe's been a private company for a very long time. I mean, these private companies now have all of these different ways to tap the capital markets, which it used to go public, so you had currency to, to you know to to buy companies to have greater uh, uh you know uh to greater greater R and D you know, a whole host of other things. And now like there's a whole bunch of shadow banking sort of things servicing these companies. So I think the dynamics have changed. And it's also one of the reasons why I think some of these big money center banks who've made big bets since the financial crisis that they've kind of taken on some other, you know, capabilities by uh, M&A, forced M&A, that sort of thing. They thought they were going to be, you know, running and gunning in the investment banking world. And I just don't think they are because a lot of other folks have kind of kind of entered the fray, if you will. Sticking with M&A, Stu, and I know, again, we we are from a similar world. Our worlds have now, we've gone our separate ways, but we're realigning now. Earlier this week, again, it was announced, the deal was announced, but we're seemingly getting more granular here. ExxonMobil and a $60 billion with a B dollar all stock deal to buy Pioneer Natural. Um, it's interesting to me because think about this. That's a shale play. Everybody's talked about the death of the energy complex for years now, but ExxonMobil sees it worthwhile to make a $60 billion acquisition in a down, effectively a downstream play to add to their portfolio. It doesn't sound like they think the energy space is going away anytime soon. I agree with that. Um, you may have to correct me on the stats of what energy makes up in total market cap, but it's like single digit. I think it's 4%, 4% but I might be wrong. Yeah, that's where I thought it was. So it's like 4%. And like in the 70s, it was something mm-hmm. like 10, 12%. And I think they're probably eyeing off like even in this administration that is so anti sort of American energy, that energy independence means growth. It means security. It means um, it means you can thrive as a country. And I think every country out there is trying to work out what energy independence means with this multi- multipolar, maybe even World War Three kind of situation going on. Right. And so, um, yeah, we need to America needs to like double down and invest on on in shell and fr- maybe fracking in certain areas. And then those pipelines from Canada, like we consume a lot, a lot of that, uh, that sludge over there. Right. And so how do we get that safely down here so that we're not, you know, inefficient uh, and when we need it. Danny, we talk to Porter and Vinny all the time and I know energy still is, you know, on top of mind for them, but you obviously saw this as well. I mean, am I on the right track here in my way of thinking, or am I just looking at it through my own personal dogma, trying to reinforce my bullish narrative? No, listen, go back to January, separate from Porter Vinny for a second. On this podcast, we talked about, said, if you're an investment banker and this is your year for M&A, the problem has been now the cost of finance, these deals, we know what happened last year, right? These deals got hung. What sector, if you work in an investment bank, can you be busy on? It's energy. 
Now, granted, this is an all stock deal, but I think you're going to see more and more of this. Yes, for uh, uh, strategic reasons. Secondly, because take advantage of elevated stock prices that obviously that they have. Their balance sheets are in perfect condition. So, I mean, not, not all of them are perfect, but take advantage. And yes, I think there's going to be more M&A in this, and, and it's an opportunity to become more vertically integrated, as you just talked about, and horizontally integrated. And so I think we're going to see more of these. This is a very large deal. You're right. I don't think there's any antitrust issues on this thing. We'll see. We'll see what happens, but it is a large deal. Sir. Stu, before we get out of here, I mean, again, you're the CEO of a company. You have, a, you have a, the lives of many people really in your hands. If you think about your employees, your client base, you know, it's that Shakespeare thing. Uneasy is the head that lies the crown. I get it. And you're the right person for the job. But what do you look at? You get up in the morning. What are you looking at to sort of see if the world is on the right course or if we've sort of shifted or things have moved and you know, what are the, what are the things that you, I know what I look at, Dan looks at, Danny looks at, what are the things that you look at? Yeah, I don't, it's probably pretty similar having spent 16 years doing macro trading. So, um, obviously tens, fixed income stuff, uh, high level indices. Then I'm looking, um, at some of the FX still, I still look at it every mm-hmm. single day. I'm not looking at all like 60 cross currency pairs and all that <laughs> stuff, but maybe the top 10, um, and some of the crosses, um, and then macroeconomic news, it still drives, I think most of the stuff that's going to like see the big tectonic shifts Um, and then options derivative uh, leverage that's going on. I think it's super, super interesting, at least in the equity market. I think there's a potential um, time bomb, if I can say it like that. There's like a danger there that we need to be really, really cognizant of. So I'm looking at like VIX, I'm looking at the move index and things like that. Danny Moses, you are now 10 and six. We have reached week six in the league where they play for pay. You've done a good job. 10 and six is extraordinary if you sort of prorate that over the course of a year, right? I mean, that's 62.5% if my math is right. So take us into this week and show us what your crystal ball says. You got it. I think I'm looking forward to Sunday as a distraction from everything going on in the world. And I just want to say one more time, I, I would tell everybody to go listen to the Mark Rowan interview from Squawk Box this morning. He's the CEO of Apollo and just listen to what he has to say. Everything he said, I completely agree with. And again, my grandparents' names were Max and Trudy Heller, the Holocaust survivors that came to the United States. And up until two years ago, my grandmother, Trudy, and I'll put this on, out on Twitter, was speaking at churches and synagogues about hiding in the woods and all the stuff that's been going on. So uh, I'll get teary-eyed talking about it, but I just want to say I feel for, for everyone out there, and it, it, really, it really is un- unsettling, to say the least. Um, all right. With that, I will tell you the web- Sunday what I'm looking forward to. So San Francisco... I believe is going to go into Cleveland and steamroll them. It almost seems too easy, minus seven. I don't think that Cleveland's going to score on San Francisco. So give me San Francisco minus seven. Cincinnati got healthy last week, guy. You know, they went out west, put a, put a pounding on um, Arizona. And I think they got it right. Seattle, oh, they're off of a bye week. They got some rest. Guess who Seattle will be? Your Giants, right? We won't give them any kind of credit for that as some other bad teams. Um, I like Cincinnati laying three at home. That line has moved, by the way, from two to three. So take Cincinnati. And then the last one of the week, it's going to be a low-scoring game, I believe, and I think it's going to be tight. And the, this team bites me every time I take them. But give me Tennessee at home plus four against Baltimore. Baltimore's lost their running game. It's all on Lamar Jackson. They got some serious injuries out there. They didn't lock, did not look great against the Steelers. And, Guy, let me say one thing. When we previewed the season, and I took 100-1 to one of a Philadelphia Eagle-Pittsburgh Steeler matchup, which probably won't happen, I said, that division is going to be a weird one. And if Pittsburgh can get out of it, and remember, never had a losing season as coach there, right? Um, Tomlin, ever, which is insane in 16 years, the 17th year. If they get, when that, they're, they're in first place right now in that division. I just want that out loud. So probably won't happen, but Pittsburgh looks like they're getting right. But those are the three, San Fran minus seven, Tennessee plus four. Balance Tennessee. of power has shifted in the AFC. I think Kansas City, obviously, is they're not as good as they've been. I think the Chargers are on the upswing. I think you're right, the Bengals got healthy, but, You know, I'm still sort of wondering about them. Dolphins, we shall see. But that Pittsburgh Steeler bet is very interesting. And if they can start to figure it out and that defense is as good as I think it is, you might be onto something, Danny Moses. So those are his week's six picks, Dan Nathan. You got some Premier League picks? You got got some Premier League picks? I I thought this was MLS. Yeah. (laughs) 
Hey, listen, a little housekeeping here. Um, Guy and I, we had a great conversation. It was meant to be our B block on today's episode, but we sat down with an old friend of ours named Tom Rogers. He is a genius. He actually invented CNBC and MSNBC under Jack Welch um, in the 80s, Guy, um, working um, at uh, NBC. And Tom is a regular contributor to CNBC. He goes on Morning Joe, and he was on uh, the pod with us yesterday. And the conversation just kept on flowing. So we said, you know what? Let's put it out as a bonus episode. So that is in the on the tape podcast feed that dropped on Thursday. So check that out. We talk about um, his views. He has been so right on Netflix, bullish of Netflix, bearish on Disney for like a decade. He is very prescient as it comes to changes in the media landscape. He also had a lot to say um, about the divisive nature of our country and how media's role in that too. And it's really interesting. There's some surprising stuff there. So check out that pod. All right, Stuart Sop, co-founder and CEO and our landlord, but CEO of Current Thing. Thanks for joining us on this pod. Danny Moses, uh, be well down there. And a lot of your sentiments, um, you know, we really do appreciate. And it's really um, for you to be able to make them um, on, on a pod like this and be able to share um, also a lot of really good thoughts about the other stuff. That's much less important. So we appreciate that. Guy Adami. You came in with some Grateful Dead. Are we going to take it out? Danny, we didn't get any ripple leer. I, I thought that maybe you would kind of, you know, just kind of sing us out with that. I'm not or a big like dead. That. It's it's hard to kind of sing. It's, it's it's hard for me. I'm not a big dead guy, but I don't mind. Though. I will tell you, though, now you can see what I do have up here on my thing, which is a nice tribute to Bob Marley up here. So I would have done that, but not in the mood. All right. We already did a little Marley a couple weeks ago, but all right. All right. Thanks, everyone, for being here with us. We'll see you next week. 